Dan Hall. This is set for Lester's height. Uh -huh. I'm Becky Hogan. I welcome you today to Books Between Bites. And Lester and I were discussing, I should have looked it up how many years he's been coming, but he, my father discovered him over at the homestead visiting his parents. And my father died in 2003, and it was when we were at the, the Methodist Church. So we're talking the late, the, in you think maybe 92 or so. And he's come just about every year since then, and we're thrilled to have him join us again today. And we see, I see some good Lester fans, and we're going to have sports talk today, <laughs> as always. <laughs> and I just want to tell you, we, I have a clipboard in the back table. If you want to be on our email list that I send out once a month, just to tell what's happening the next month, please feel free to sign up. And I will add you, and you'll hear from me once a month. So without further ado, Lester. I think I've been doing this for so long that I'm two inches shorter than I was. <laughs> the, uh, things happen to you, as many of you out there are aware. Um, the, uh, as uh, Becky said, uh, we're going to talk about sports books, uh, and when we talk about sports books, we have to be very careful. There are a certain number of sports books out there that I would never recommend to you, <laughs> mainly autobiographies. <laughs> and my rule on sports books, in order to be a sports book that I'm going to be interested in, the writer of the book must have read at least one book. <laughs> if the writer has not ever read a book, then I'm not interested. And that, in other words, Pete Rose autobiographies. <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, we're going to talk about three books. Uh, Becky has them up on the screen. Um, Why We Love Baseball by Joe Posnanski, The Real Hoosiers by Jack McCallum, and The Tau of the backup catcher by Tim Brown and a ball player by the name of Eric Katz. Um, the uh, two baseball, one basketball, and in, in each of them, the, the sports material opens up into other material involving various other issues uh, of our culture and of our society. Uh, but we'll start with why we love baseball by Joe Posnanski. Posnanski is one of the great baseball writers. Uh, I'm acquainted with him. We worked together uh, at Sports Illustrated very briefly. I'm not sure what happened to Joe. He came to work with us at Sports Illustrated, and about three months later, he was gone. I, I don't know if I want to know what happened there. Um, but this book is an absolutely joyous history of baseball. It's the kind of book that you can pick up and let it fall open, and you will find something real good every time. Uh, you'll be laughing, you'll be crying, you'll be finding out things that you never know. I am a serious baseball fan, and this book uh, informed me of all sorts of stuff that I never uh, knew about. He organizes it into 50 moments that have become legendary among, uh, within the baseball industry and among us fans. Uh, and they range from great achievements to incredible blunders. Um, the, he ranks the 50 moments from the least important to the most important, and the, uh, you can question the ranking, but each and every one of the incidents is something that you will enjoy. It's just that kind of a book. I, I kind of wondered about this when I heard he was writing it, but it turned out to be a terrific uh, piece of work. Uh, num the number one incident in the book is no surprise. It's Henry Aaron hitting his 715th home run to break the longstanding and most hallowed record in baseball, the career home runs of Babe Ruth. Uh, the, as Joe describes it, he describes it as what happened to a black man who broke a sacred record held by a white ball player. Uh, as he was approaching 
home run number 17, Henry Aaron was the target of a lot of hate mail. He had so many death threats that as he hit the last 18 or 20 home runs, he had personal security, his kids had security when they went to school, and there were people guarding his house. The FBI became involved, and the death threats were viewed as serious. And this was, a lot of the mail was very racist and very nasty. The, uh, then, on April 8, 1974, Fulton County Stadium in Atlanta, no, the stadium is now gone, uh, 53,775 people. Uh, Aaron came up in the fourth inning uh, against the Dodgers. The pitcher was Al Downing. Um, and he, uh, Downing threw a pitch that he did not want to throw, and the ball uh, became home run number 17. Uh, Poznanski, in this book, in his charming way, tells the story of this by when Aaron started around the bases after the home run. The crowd is going crazy. In the first row, along first base, are two high school boys. They look at each other. They don't say a word, and they know what they should do. They jump over the fence and run the bases with Henry Aaron. <laughs> they were running so close to him they're patting him on the back. They didn't even plan this, they didn't discuss it, but they knew instantly this was the thing to do. Um, of course, they got in trouble, the police arrested him. Later, Henry Aaron's security detail, it turns out when they saw the boys running to first base, they were pulling out their guns. Can you imagine? They, then they realized then it was a couple of kids and they were harmless, so nothing happened, but it was a, a very close call. So Poznanski tracks down these two boys 30 years later and talks to them, and the best they could come up with, one of them said to him, well, we were kids. Kids do dumb things. That was their explanation after all this time. The, um, now that was, of course, a great moment. But uh, for me as a Cub fan, the greatest moment, you knew I was gonna come to this, right? The greatest moment was the rain delay. The rain delay in Cleveland during the seventh game of the World Series on November 2 of 2016. The, this was number four in Poznanski's list. He obviously is less of a Cub fan than I. Um, and the Cubs in that year had a phenomenal team, as we all know. They moved into first place on April 11, early in the season, and they stayed there uh, the entire season. It was a glorious season for us Cub fans. They clinched the division with two weeks left in the season, something that rarely happens. And then in the World Series, they faced the Cleveland Indians, and Cub fans began to worry because the Indians won three of the first four games of the World Series. However, game five in Wrigley Field, uh, I was actually present for that game as a fan. Uh, I will never forget it. The Cubs came back and won that game. And then they forced a seventh game which was in Cleveland. In the seventh game, and this is, Poznanski does a great job describing this. Uh, in the seventh game, the Cubbies had a three-run lead in the eighth inning. Everything was fine. And then up comes a guy named Rajai Davis. This was not even a journeyman player. He was struggling to become a, he was a nothing player. He comes up against the Cubs. There are two men on base, and incredibly, he hits it out. A three-run home run off Aroldis Chapman, a guy who could throw harder than anybody else in baseball. Now, if you're a Cub fan, 
you know that that's the end. We're finished. We haven't got a chance. It was just automatic, a reflexive response. Oh, no, it's over. The dream has come to an end. It was still a tie game in the eighth inning, but you knew things were now turning bad. Uh, the, we went through the ninth inning, and then in extra innings, now the rain comes. There was a rain delay of 17 minutes. During that rain delay, Jason Hayward, the right fielder, a guy who had struggled all year, he saw the Cubs all dejected, heads hanging down, very unhappy, knowing that bad things were about to happen. He got them together in a tiny weight room. They're all basically piled up on top of each other, and he lectured them for five or six minutes about how good they were and how they were going to go out and win the World Series. He turned them around all during the rain delay. Without the rain delay, things would not have gone well. The, um, the Cubs came out after the rain delay. Kyle Schwarber got a hit, uh, and then they scored two runs, and they won the World Series. Now, this is the flag of Chicago. And it has symbolic importance. The blue stripes are the waterways of Chicago, Chicago River and Lake Michigan. The white stripes, for some reason, are supposed to represent the neighborhoods of Chicago. And then we have these four stars. One is for Fort Dearborn, one is for the Great Chicago Fire, one is for the uh, World's Fair in 1893, and the fourth is for the Century of Progress, which was in 1933 in Chicago. Now, I am here to tell you we need a fifth star. <laughs> we need a fifth star for the rain delay. <laughs> I have been campaigning for that ever since, and I have gotten nowhere. <laughs> Nor do I expect the campaign to succeed. But when I get a chance like this, an opportunity like, like Books Between Bites, I will be telling people about the fifth star for the rain delay. Uh, another historic moment in Posnansky's book involved the Cubs pitcher, Kerry Wood. Kerry mm -hmm. Wood was a very promising pitcher. He could throw the ball very hard, and early in his career, he had a curveball that would come in and drop at a 45 degree angle. You could see the ball turn and drop. It, it seemed to be superhuman what he could do with his curveball. So he came out to pitch in May of 1998. This is one of the 50. Uh, highlights in Poznanski's book. And it was just another Kerry Wood assignment, but he was such a promising pitcher that there was a guy in the bleachers in left field, one of the famous bleacher bums who sit out there, and he brought with him 16 three-foot cards with a big letter K on them. K in baseball means strikeout. And he was going to hold up, he was going to hang a card on the wall for every strikeout. And he brought 16 cards. As it turned out, Kerry Wood reached strikeout 16 in the seventh inning. And he, as the game went on, he struck out 20 people. One of the greatest performances by any Cub pitcher or any pitcher at any time. Roger Clemens did it. I think he's the only pitcher who, who has also struck out 20 people in that inning. Some of you may be able to correct me on that. But now he only had 16 of these big Ks. What is he going to do? The boys in the bleachers knew what to do. Four of them take off their shirts <laughs> and they paint a giant K on their chest and stomach. 
These were not athletic looking guys. <laughs> These were giant K's on big guys. So 16 cards and four K's on the bodies of these boys and the rest. Uh, then, so Kerry Wood was, was acknowledged uh, in a very unexpected way. Another episode in Poznanski's book involves baseball royalty, uh, Yogi Berra and Jackie Robinson. The, uh, Yogi Berra is one of the all-time great characters uh, in all of baseball. He is famous for various observations. Uh, we're at spring training right now. There was a time when Yogi Berra was at spring training with the Yankees, and he was talking to the reporters, and he explained to them that during spring training, the pitchers are always ahead of the hitters and vice versa. <laughs> Yo, only Yogi knew this. He was once in a restaurant, a pizza restaurant, and they brought the pizza to the table and they said, okay, Mr. Berra, we're gonna slice up this pizza. Should we cut it up into eight pieces or six pieces? He says, you better cut it into six. I could never eat eight. <laughs> That's Yogi Berra. <laughs> September 1955, he is the catcher for the Yankees in the World Series, and they're playing the Dodgers. This is one of the great World Series of all time. The Yankees and the Dodgers in those years played in the World Series five different years. Uh, the, the Yankees had won the first four. And <clears throat> Robinson, who is one of the great base runners of all time, is on third base. Whitey Ford is pitching for the Yankees, a left-handed pitcher. <clears throat> and Robinson, in his way, is tormenting the pitcher, threatening to steal home. And then finally, as Whitey Ford delivers the pitch, Robinson runs in, slides into home, and the umpire, a guy named Bill Stafford, calls him safe. Yogi Berra knew that he was out. He had tagged him, and he knew in his heart and in his mind that he was out. And he explodes arguing with the umpire. The umpire, thank goodness, did not throw Yogi out of the game. He could have, uh, but, but Berra was very unhappy with the call. And incredibly, that play became a symbol for the whole series, and the Dodgers won that World Series over the Yankees. The, there is now a Yogi Berra Museum in Little Falls, New Jersey. A whole museum devoted to Yogi Berra. It's worth a look if you happen to be driving through Little Falls, New Jersey for some reason. Stop and see the Yogi. And until he died, Yogi Berra enjoyed being in the museum and talking to the fans who came in. On the wall is a giant photo of that play. Robinson stealing home, sliding in, the umpire calling him safe, and, the, and that picture is in a prominent place. For, for the, from the time of the opening of the museum until the end of his life, when Yogi walked by that picture, he would say, out. <laughs> he couldn't resist. Over the years, he would encounter Jackie Robinson's widow, Rachel Robinson, at various baseball events. They would come up to each other, and Yogi would say, out, and Rachel Robinson would say, safe, and they would have a big hug. <laughs> so that is part of uh, the Poznanski uh, 50 great episodes. Uh, the next one involves Pete Rose. Uh, on September 11th, 1985, he singled to right field, opposite field single. That was hit for him number 4,192, and he broke Ty Cobb's record and became what Pete Rose likes to say, the hit king in the history of baseball. Uh, Posnanski, who is very joyous in his presentation of all these 50 episodes, uh, is not as he talks about Pete Rose. Uh, he shows his disgust and his scorn for Rose in numerous ways, 
describes him as an obsessive gambler, which he was, an obsessive womanizer, which he no question was, a uh, convicted tax evader, which he was. Uh, Pete Rose is now, uh, makes a living signing autographs for cash, $20, and he will sign anything that you bring, a baseball, a jersey. Luckily for him, if you're gonna sign autographs for a living, Pete Rose is a good name to have. <laughs> it's only got eight letters. You know, if you were Nomar Garcia Para, <laughs> you couldn't do so well signing autographs. Um, the, uh, the hit that broke the record um, was, as I said, was a single to the opposite field off a pitcher named Eric Schau on the San Diego Padres. There are famous scene when Rose is at first base, his son wearing a duplicate uniform, I think he was 12 years old, comes out. They're hugging uh, at first base. And uh, it was all a very wonderful, emotional moment. However, later, in, uh, later on, uh, Rose's gambling became a problem for baseball. And at a certain point, the Lords of Baseball decided they're gonna to have to call Rose in and do something about his gambling. Incredibly, at this time, there were two commissioners of baseball, the outgoing commissioner, Peter Uberoff, and the incoming commissioner, a guy named Bartlett Giamatti, who had left the job as president of Yale to become commissioner of baseball. Bartlett Giamatti, his son Paul Giamatti is the actor whom you may have seen uh, in some great, a terrific actor. Um, he was nominated for an Academy Award, was up uh, a couple of weeks ago. So they, they called Pete Rose into the office of the commissioner. Um, some of this Posnansky has, some of this is my own reporting at the time. Rose comes into the room and on the wall are photos of Babe Ruth, Lou Gehrig, Yogi Berra, Stan Musial. And his first question is to the two commissioners and their lawyers, where's my picture? He was insulted that his picture was not on the wall. Um, on this occasion, when they called him in about his gambling, he was wearing a suit and a tie. The suit was an iridescent green. It's the kind of material that under the light turns colors. And he had a red tie. It was all very nice, except the suit was a tailor-made suit for 20 pounds earlier in his life. It didn't look so good. He, they, they explained to him that uh, they had to do something about his gambling, and his response was, you're not going to do anything. I am a national treasure. A national treasure. Who knew that Pete Rose had this vocabulary? Uh, I am a national treasure. And the one commissioner, the outgoing, Uberoth, said to him, OK, fine, we're not going to do anything. Giamatti, the incoming commissioner, said, wait a minute. We're going to investigate. And he hired a, a, a lawyer, a super Washington lawyer named John Dowd, did the investigation. They found out about thousands of bets that Pete Rose had made, including bets on baseball. And they banned him for life. And he remains uh, banned for life. Soon thereafter, he was charged with tax fraud and tax evasion. It turns out that as he got the winning the record-breaking single, hit number 4,192. He's wearing a Cincinnati Reds jersey, number 14, and he was using a black Mizuno bat. Mizuno is a manufacturing company, makes uh, bats in Japan. Over the, over the next year, Rose sold the bat 14 times to collectors. He sold the jersey 11 times that we know of. This came out because he did not pay the tax on the income from his fraudulent sales. Um, so that just gives you a, a, a look at uh,
Pete Rose and perhaps explains why Poznanski treats him with such scorn and disrespect. You see, here's some of that from me too, obviously. Um, now, the, the next uh, episode involves an outfielder on the Cleveland Indians named Rocky Calavito. Rocco Domenico Calavito, one of the great names in the history of baseball. He was a terrific hitter. He hit 374 home runs, and more significantly, he had maybe the greatest throwing arm in the history of baseball. He played right field, and he could throw the ball a mile, and he would throw people out at third base and home. He became a folk hero in Cleveland, something of a heartthrob, and he loved, after, later after he retired, he was a coach at Cleveland, and what he would do is, during batting practice, he would stand at home plate and throw the ball into the center field stands, something no other player could. This is after he retired, I mean, he had this arm. There was a, uh, a ball game. Uh, they're playing the Yankees in a doubleheader. There is a short fly hit to Calavito in right field. Mickey Mantle of the Yankees is on third base. It's too short a fly ball for Mantle to try to score, but the um, Rocky throws the ball in. He uncorks a wild throw. It went six feet over the catcher's head and hit the wall behind home plate. Mantle, seeing this, thinks he can trot in and score, but the ball bounced from the wall straight to the catcher, who then tagged out Mickey Mantle, to Mantle's amazement. So then they ask Rocky, did you throw the ball off the wall on purpose? So he claims he did. There is some doubt about that. Uh, one more episode from this joyous baseball book. Uh, 1954 World Series, Cleveland Indians are playing. They were overwhelmingly favored. They had won 111 games during that season. Um, they had a pitching staff that was the greatest pitching staff, perhaps, in the history of baseball. Uh, Bob Feller, Bob Lemon, Early Wynn, and Mike Garcia. They were an overwhelming favorite to beat the Giants. Uh, in the first game, in the eighth inning, the Vic Wirtz is up uh, for the Indians. He hits a fly ball. To, this is in the polo grounds in New York, which was in, an oval-shaped baseball field. Center field was 440 feet from home plate. Wirtz hits the ball straight to center field. Willie Mays turns his back on the infield, runs back, makes the famous catch backwards to the infield, maybe the greatest catch in the history of baseball. And he not only did that, he turned on a dime, threw the ball back in so that Larry Doby of the Indians could not score from third base. The Giants, after that catch, won the World Series uh, in four straight. Um, the, those are examples of what Posnanski does uh, in the book. There are others that bring tears to your eyes. I was afraid to do any of those here because I knew what I would do. I cry at anything. I have been known to cry at card tricks. <laughs> the, uh, so you're going to have to look at those yourself. Yeah. Um, now, The Real Hoosiers is by Jack McCallum. Jack McCallum was a colleague of mine at Sports Illustrated. He and I remain friends. He is probably one of the two greatest basketball writers in the history of sports media. And this is his third book. I talked about one here a couple years ago, Dream Team, uh, the Michael Jordan team that went to the Olympics, which was a wonderful book. Here he tells the story of Oscar Robertson uh, and his high school career in the state of Indiana. Until Michael Jordan came along, Oscar Robertson was probably the greatest basketball player ever. Uh, some of you here are old enough to remember him. He became known as the Big O. He could do everything, 6'5". <coughs> he saw the entire basketball court. He, he was a great shooter. He was a great passer. 
um, a triple-double, which is a great achievement for a basketball player, was what he did basically uh, in every game. And this is a story of how Oscar Robertson came up through uh, Indiana. Now, basketball was not born in Indiana, but it did grow up there. And basketball is really a centerpiece of the culture uh, of Indiana. Oscar went to Crispus Attucks High School. It was a high school that had just opened 10 or 12 years earlier. At the time he, Oscar, entered high school, Thurgood Marshall was in the Supreme Court arguing Brown versus Board of Education. Mm. Uh, the murder of Emmett Till in Mississippi happened in, this, in Oscar's freshman year. And in the same year, Rosa Parks refused to sit on the back of the bus. And this sets up the story of racism in Indiana that was part of Oscar's life uh, as he grew up. His great-grandfather was a slave in Tennessee. The, uh, just as an example of the racist speech, the racist culture of the, of the Jim Crow era, which lasted into the 50s in Indiana, here is Governor James Vardaman. J McCallum, the writer, quotes him in the book. James Vardaman, governor of Mississippi, says, if it is necessary, every Negro in Mississippi will be lynched. Oh. It will be done to maintain white supremacy. These are direct quotes from the governor. The only effect of Negro education is to spoil a good field hand and to make an insolent cook. This is what we're dealing with. And Indiana, and Oscar's time, there was Ku Klux Klan effects throughout the state. There are some who say the Klan was born in a town in Indiana. There's some doubt about that. But his high school, Crispus Attucks High School, was built by the Board of Education in Indianapolis for the sole purpose of housing the black population and keeping the black students away from the white schools. The board that, Jack points this out in the book, the board that made this decision was five people, all of them had Klan connections. <clears throat> His coach was a guy named Ray Crow, um, and the Crispus Attucks is named for a, a, for a runaway slave whose name was Crispus Attucks. He was the first soldier to die in the Revolutionary War. Again, there's, this may be apocryphal, but it, that is the reason that Crispus Attucks was named. Uh, as they built this high school to house the black population, they did not put in a gym. There was no gym. Oscar and his team had to play all their games either away at the other high school or in the Butler University Fieldhouse. There was a quiet racism that pervaded Indianapolis. McCallum describes it as a slow burn of racism. There was one public swimming pool for 70,000 black folks. They were not allowed in the, other, in the other pools where the white folks were. They were prevented from moving into certain areas. The schools were carefully segregated. 95% of the restaurants in Indianapolis at this time barred black folks. Oscar and his teammates typically ate on the bus because they couldn't get in restaurants and the coach would go and get the food and bring it to them on the bus. He, he grew up playing in a playground known as the Dust Bowl, but at the same time, he was a student of the game. He accumulated a library of books on coaching basketball even as he was 17 uh, and 18 years old. He faced biased referees in most of his games. Uh, he frequently heard the N-word from the fans in the stands. There was a guy who ran the high school sports in Indiana. He did not allow the black schools to participate in the tournaments until uh, 1949, a couple years before Oscar began to play. Um, the, Jack has a wonderful history of how basketball developed and of some of the stars in the state of Indiana. 
Uh, there have been many famous basketball players from Indiana. However, I, this was the first time I read that James Dean, the actor, was a star basketball player at Fairmount High School in Indiana. Who, who else knew that? I, can, can you believe this? He was a terrific basketball player. The, um, the, they, Jack also, as he, as he describes the racist culture, describes a lynching in Marion, Indiana in 1930. A lynching in Indiana in 1930. It was one of 20 that are recorded uh, in the history of Indiana. Here some citizens stormed the jail. Two young black men were locked up in the jail. Um, they were accused uh, in a very vague uh, situation of being involved with a white woman. The citizens of Marion crashed into the jail. The police and fire departments went elsewhere and they hung these guys from a tree outside the jail. They left the bodies hanging in the air through the night. Citizens came and took pieces of bark from the tree as souvenirs. They pulled all the clothes off these guys as they were hanging uh, from the tree. The, this was based on a community belief that black folks were taking over and that the justice system would not adequately punish them. Uh, there's a famous photo that was taken of this lynching, of the bodies hanging, and the people smiling and smirking and gathering around. Um, this was not in McCallum's book, but um, I am a graduate of the University of Chicago Law School. Long after I was gone, Barack Obama was an instructor at said law school. And he taught a course on racism in American law. And he used this picture of this lynching in his opening class. It was a dramatic way to introduce his students into the kind of legal developments that allowed for lynchings. Um, the, now, Oscar and his teammates over two seasons won 62 games and lost one. The one that they lost, McCallum describes, it was probably the result of some calls by white referees. Uh, Jack also goes out of his way to differentiate the story of his story of basketball from Hoosiers, the movie with Gene Hackman and Dennis Hopper and Barbara Hersey. Some of you have seen it's a great movie, um, but apparently historically inaccurate. I'm not sure that bothers me very much. It's still a great movie. Um, the, uh, but, but Jack was very uh, upset about it. It's based on a game uh, that was actually played, and it was the last game before Oscar came along and then won three state championships. The, um, there is a, a beautiful description of an epic uh, state championship game Oscar and his teammates were the first black team to win the state tournament in Indiana. They were the first team from Indianapolis to win uh, the tournament in Indiana. He won the game with a shot in the last 14 seconds. And then there's a celebration downtown in Indianapolis, and the mayor at the time, a white mayor, made sure that the parade got downtown and quickly left for the black neighborhood. He was worried about having the black folks downtown. Oscar Robertson remained angry about that. Even today, if he came in here, he would tell us about it. The, um, is, his, is this his team the greatest high school basketball team of all time? It may be. One of its competitors, and Jack points this out in the book, is a team from Chicago, DuSable High School Panthers. Um, they had a team, when I was in high school, I was a, a, a very mediocre high school basketball player, but one of the things that we talked about at Glenbard High School was DuSable and its success as we were struggling to learn how to play the game. They had uh, three stars, a guy with the great name of Paxton Lumpkin, uh, Shelly McMillan, Charlie Brown, 
Uh, they were undefeated all year. They went to Urbana to play the state championship, and they lost. There were some refereeing calls. They lost to Mount Vernon from way downstate, and there were some calls by the referees that were egregiously uh, incorrect. The DuSable team was a lot of fun. Uh, they were the first team to be dunking the ball in the, in the warm-ups before the game. And just to make sure everybody noticed, they wore black capes as they flew <laughs> through the air and dunked the ball. Um, the, there is uh, an enduring theme in this book of us in the sports media typically saying the white players are highly disciplined, highly trained, they practice, and they're smart. And the black players, we say, have great athleticism, great natural ability. It's a clearly a biased use of the word. So when, you, when you're watching a game or you're reading about athleticism, think twice. Ordinarily, that is a, a racially biased statement that is being made even now, even now. Um, all right, the last book is the Tao of the backup catcher. Tao, T-A-O. Um, Playing Baseball for the Love of the Game by Tim Brown, a sports writer, and Eric Katz, a backup catcher. What is a Tao? Tao is the unconditional and unknowable source and guiding principle of all reality. Another defini definition is it's the art of doing something in harmony with the essential nature of whatever it is, or the process of nature by which all things change and which is to be followed for a life of harmony. It's kind of a spiritual and emotional look at why people persist in doing things they do. Um, this is in a, 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 it's a wonderful book. It describes the grind of a comparative comparatively me mediocre player whose jobs are always in doubt and who bounce from team to team, usually at the minor league level. Eric Katz, the backup catcher in the book, played 19 seasons of baseball, 14 major league teams, and 16 minor league teams. Imagine, 30 teams in 19 seasons. He never unpacked. <laughs> His wife and three sons are going from place to place. But he stayed with it. And, and you get a sense of his dedication and what he brought to the teams, uh, even as he bounced from team to team. A, a comparable example to the backup catcher in the book, and this is in the book, is David Ross, who became manager of the Chicago Cubs. He wanted to be in the starting lineup like any baseball star. And finally he realized he was a backup catcher. And once he accepted that, he became a great teammate, David Ross, and he was in a World Series with the Red Sox and with the Cubs and then became manager of the Cubs. Um, here's the very first sentence of the book. If you will work your whole young life to become strong and clever, to see the game in ways others do not or cannot. If you will commit wholly to yourself, to the group, to the win, and to today, and if you will then give it all away, you will be the backup catcher. Um, the, this is a really, it's a serious book about serious issues, and then there are these moments in which you break into laughter or you're crying. The, it's a terrific book um, that, uh, that I would recommend. The, here, here's one of the final sentences. The most we can do is show up, play on, believe in something, celebrate the good stuff, laugh at the dumb stuff, and have a good cry. Block a ball in the dirt for a friend once in a while, and then be the sort of person others can rely on. Um, the, this is a good book for almost anybody. You do not need to be a baseball fan to appreciate this book. It, it's a great book just on the way life can and should be. The, uh, the Poznanski book, the first one I talked about, is also a book for pretty much everybody. 
Uh, it is so charming, so joyous, and so funny. And you don't have to read it from beginning to end. You can just drop in anywhere and enjoy uh, what he is doing. Uh, the Oscar Robertson book is a serious book about racism uh, in the world of sports and in the state of Indiana. Uh, a great story of Oscar Robertson, one of the greatest players of all time. And I think for that you really have to be uh, kind of a lot very interested in basketball. Okay, that's it from me. We have a few minutes for questions. Catherine. You talked about autobiographies that you wouldn't want to be reading. I want to recommend Pull Up the Chair by Red Barber. Okay, Red Barber, uh, it's his memoir. Yep. Red Barber was the guy who was on WBEZ every morning for so long. He was wonderful. Friday, so Friday mornings. Yeah, a, uh, a great philosopher and a great baseball announcer. Um, I can imagine that would be a very good book. I grew up on Red Barber and the Brooklyn Dodgers. He started mm -hmm. doing the uh, Brooklyn Dodger games in 1934. The Dodgers have had Red Barber and Vin Scully. They have been uniquely blessed with uh, great broadcasters. Oh, the Cubs have had great broadcasters, too. Um, who can forget Vince Lloyd and Lou Boudreau? Um, for you first basemen out there in the audience, <laughs> here is how you cover the bag. Yeah. Um, okay, yes. Caleb Williams. Oh, boy. <laughs> Be Becky, Becky said you're going to get Bear's question. Yeah. Um, Caleb Williams. Uh, is the quarterback at University of Southern California. The Chicago Bears are probably going to draft him uh, with draft pick number one here in several weeks. Uh, it will be yet another attempt by the Chicago Bears to find a major league professional quarterback who can play the game. Um, I am 83 years old. I've been watching the Bears probably for 75 years. There was one great quarterback, Sid Luckman. That was in, he left in 1946. That tells you how bad things have been. Um, there, we are uniquely cursed with a history of bust out quarterbacks. Will Caleb Williams be an exception to this? We sure hope so. And there is every indication that he is a great generational, as we now say, player. Um, the Bears have the capacity, however, for the major blunder, as we know. Um, and maybe he will be the answer, maybe not. Um, it, lo it looks like they are going to draft him. They could do something different. Yeah, I, you're right. I, yeah, they will draft him. Yeah. But they, they traded away their quarterback yep. to make room for Caleb Williams. So the. Um, Yes, we're, okay. Uh, you probably know Batavia has a connection with Hank Aaron. Craig Sager was the one that interviewed him when he came around third base to touch the home plate. Craig Sager, Sager from Batavia? Craig Sager is from Batavia. I did not know that. I knew that he did the interview, yeah. Wow, that's interesting. Kosnanski missed that in his account. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in the back. What's your opinion of the, uh, the baseball, or the White Sox and the Bears wanting new stadiums? Well, um, the uh, very interesting question. What are my thoughts on the White Sox and the Bears uh, trying to get a new stadium? And the, the Red Stars. And the Red Stars. Oh, the, the, the Red Stars, the soccer team, also needs a stadium. Um, the uh, Chicago Bears purchased a giant piece of property in Arlington Heights. It would seem to me that they spent $192 million on that property. Um, they want to build a stadium there that would closely resemble the new football stadium in Las Vegas, known as Allegiant Stadium. They have hired the architects and the developers who did the stadium in Las Vegas. Uh, they have the idea that they can create a community around that stadium. Um, and in the meantime, uh, in order to obtain 
a favorable tax situation in Arlington Heights. They have been flirting with other ideas, trying to create leverage against Arlington Heights. The Arlington Heights, just in the last couple of days, made a proposal. Uh, the issue here is, after they have built the stadium, they will be paying real estate tax on the stadium, just as we all have paid real estate tax on our houses or our buildings. And they are trying to keep the real estate tax down by getting concessions from Arlington Heights before they start the construction. Uh, Naperville has offered property. Uh, Mayor Johnson of Chicago has ideas of, for a stadium uh, near the lake. Uh, Waukegan, uh, way up north, is interested as a uh, proposal. But to me, the Bears, well, and another possibility is that both the Bears and the White Sox will build together on an area at Roosevelt Road and Clark Street on the near south side of the city. That is a legitimate possibility. There's a developer who's working on that. Um, but to me, the Bears are committed to Arlington Heights. I doubt that will happen. The White Sox um, succeeded in ripping off our community for the recent stadium. I have a feeling Jerry Reinsdorf will outsmart us again <laughs> with another rip-off stadium. Uh, it's what he does. He's a real estate guy. Um, I, I'm no fan of the White Sox, but um, <laughs> you know they do what they do. And Reinsdorf does what he does. The, um, I think that he will probably succeed in the stadium at Roosevelt and Clark, um, which will be a great improvement for Sox fans uh, instead of having to go to the current, uh, now known as Guaranteed Rate Stadium. But that's the best I can, the, the, I would, interestingly, if we gather next February here, and I tell you, and I talk about some other books, this situation will be the same as it is now. <laughs> it will not have changed. <laughs> Lifeline has been thrown to Sports Illustrated by a company called Minute Media. Yeah. What do you think of their chance to survive? Uh, the question is, uh, can Sports Illustrated, my former employer, survive now that it has a lifeline from this new company that has come in? Uh, a few weeks ago, it appeared that Sports Illustrated was dead. Uh, the company that owned it had failed to pay a loan and they cut everybody off. Um, this is a very promising development. Um, I, I learned of that yesterday. Um, I wrote a couple notes to former colleagues of mine. I'm sure they've replied, but I haven't seen them yet this morning. I, there is hope, uh, but Sports Illustrated now is a monthly. When I worked there, it was a weekly. We, we had a fantastic staff. We produced a great magazine. It was a joy to work there. It's now a monthly. It was doing very good long-form articles as a monthly, and my hope is uh, that it will come back. The leader of the staff is a guy named John Wertheim. Uh, some of you may have seen him on 60 Minutes. He's a correspondent for 60 Minutes. He's also uh, on the Tennis Channel. He is a very shrewd, clever, interesting guy, he may be able to pull this off. It is he who is the, the force. He somehow found this. Um, so there is hope. Uh, it was a great magazine for 75 years, and uh, it, it could be the end. It, we'll see where this is a year from now, <laughs> assuming I can make it out here. Yeah. <laughs> yes? Question on the college athletics uh, mill payments and all the college athletes getting these millions of dollars now. Where do you see college sports going in terms of amateurs and professionalism? Yeah, the, the question is uh, about nil, name, image, and likeness payments to college athletes. This began in a series of antitrust cases 
10 years ago, the first one was tried in Oakland, California. That began to tear down the NCAA's governing structure so that now all these things can happen. Um, the Caitlin Clark, the fantastic player for the Iowa Hawkeyes team, uh, is apparently making $3 million on NIL payments. She will make less money playing professional basketball than she will be making on NIL. There are college players who haven't played a single play in college football who are already collecting hundreds of thousands of dollars. This comes after a system in which college players were basically indentured servants who got very little other than a scholarship for all their efforts and bringing in all the money that they bring into the schools. So the, the situation is in complete turmoil. There's litigation. There are state legislatures getting ready to take action. The NCAA is trying to obtain legislation in the Congress that will protect it and the colleges from all these payments. Um, it's a, the, the leadership of college sports has utterly failed to understand this development and to figure out what to do. Uh, and I think the turmoil will continue. The athletes will prosper. Um, I don't see how the NCAA is going to get the Congress. Congress can't even pass a budget, yes. you know, <laughs> much less college sports legislation. Will the NCAA survive? Pardon me? Will the NCAA it, survive? Uh, probably, I would say not. I think the NCAA is in its final year or two. And there will, there will be a decentralizing of the authority. The conferences will become vastly more important, the big five conferences. Okay. What was the uh, thinking behind, uh, the Cubs thinking behind raiding Milwaukee's Red Council and then, pay, and then getting rid of David Ross, who we talked about, of course. Yeah. And not only that, but paying Red Council, was paying Red Council, uh, I think he's, he's one of the top uh, paid managers. Uh, yeah. I think he's the highest paid manager. Well, yeah. what, what, is, what is the Cubs thinking if they're doing that? Uh, the question is, what were the Cubs doing when they fired David Ross, the guy I talked about briefly here, uh, and hired Craig Council, the manager of the arch rival Milwaukee Brewers, um, and paid Council probably double what anybody else would have paid him? Um, the, uh, what was the Cubs thinking? <laughs> the eternal question <laughs> goes back to Brock Fabrolio. I mean, <laughs> um, I, I was totally surprised by this. Um, the World Series team that I talked about, a, a couple of years before they were in the World Series, they did a similar thing. They fired a perfectly good manager and hired Joe Madden. I think the current leadership of the Cubs thinks this is somehow what you do. Council will be a very good manager. There's no question about that. He did a great job with the Brewers. I, I did not think David Ross was that bad a manager. So I don't know what was wrong there. Um, but they, it's an indication that they want to win now. Um, I probably would have preferred if they had uh, signed a contract with Blake Snell or Matt Chapman instead of a new manager. But they decided the manager was the key. Uh, they did bring back Cody Bellinger, which is very positive. Um, so maybe we're in for a good year. We'll see. I, 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 I think, Becky, you got to get Jed Hoyer here. We can ask him when he, uh, when he gets ready. Yes. Um, so it, it happened yesterday, but there was some pretty shocking news regarding Shohei Otani, the translator, um, involving gambling and payments for their persons. Obviously, over the past couple of years, sports gambling has taken over sports. Um, you can't turn out a game, you can't listen to the radio, or basically do anything involving sports without being bombarded by these ads. You're right. Kind of, what's your take on both how this has proliferated recently, how we've now we're seeing it impact baseball's biggest star, arguably ever, in terms of talent level, 
I mean, it seems like this, what happened yesterday, could be the start of a massive, massive discussion and story regarding sports betting in baseball. Okay, the question is, uh, relates to the explosion of sports gambling. You cannot avoid ads for sports books on any broadcast. And the recent disclosure that Shohei Otani, the star of all of baseball, his translator was caught with major gambling debts, four and a half million dollars, I believe. Um, now, as luck would have it, I have a one-hour lecture on the menace of sports gambling. <laughs> I recently gave it, uh, and I was pretty happy with the way it came out. So I'm, I'm on the side that sports gambling is a very bad development, uh, that things are going to get very much worse than they are. I equate sports gambling as an addictive industry like tobacco and opioids. And the advertising, the, the advertising is exploiting vulnerable, primarily young men, into doing things they should not be doing and spending money they don't even have. It's a, it, I view it as a complete menace. Uh, the Otani, Shohei Otani is the highest paid baseball player and may be the greatest baseball player of all time, as you suggest. Uh, and his translator worked himself into a hole, uh, obvious signs of obsessive compulsive gambling. And he, st he may have stolen four and a half million dollars from Shohei Otani. The question is, what was Shohei Otani's role in this gambling? Shohei Otani was playing for the Angels. He had inside information on games. He was the pitcher in games. Was he helping this guy chase his bets? The, the translator was obviously in a deep hole. He was trying to win bets to get out of the hole, and the hole got deeper. This is not a big surprise in gambling. Um, and as you suggest, there's more to come. I, this could be, you don't want to say black socks, but um, th this could be a real bad situation. If the commissioner of baseball faces the prospect of disciplining Shohei Otani, then we're going to see uh, some really interesting things. And that is possible. Also, it could just stop with the translator. Maybe it will. I I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure. Um, and, and this is all happening as the season begins. So, okay, thank you. Thank you, everybody.